Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion on demystifying human rights due diligence. Just wait a few minutes for everyone to connect. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Good afternoon to Europe and Africa. Good morning to the Americas. Thanks for joining our panel on demystifying human rights due diligence. We'll just wait a couple minutes for everyone to connect. Thanks. Okay, we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our panel today on demystifying human rights due diligence. We're really excited to finally host this. We had some technical difficulties last month, and then we have a really great and busy panel. So it took us a while to reschedule, but it's going to be worth it. And thank you so much for joining us. So my name is Charlotte Opal. I'm with the Earthworm Foundation, and we are co-hosting this uh, it's not a webinar, it's a panel discussion uh, with Global Rights Compliance from the UK. So I'll just quickly, if you can move to the next slide, please may, just quickly introduce Earthworm. We are a nonprofit headquartered in Switzerland with uh, companies all, uh, excuse me, offices all over the world, as you can see on the map. And uh, we started off over 20 years ago, uh, really focusing on tropical forests, tropical rainforest protection, but we realized quite early on that you can't do that if human rights are being abused. Uh, you can't protect the environment if human rights are being abused. So quite early in our, in our history, we started working, again, mostly in forests, so working a lot on land rights, free prior and informed consent. And then as we moved into agriculture supply chains in the last 10 years, a little more than 10 years, we've also expanded to, to look at worker rights issues as well. Um, and so maybe the next slide, just to show you the kinds of supply chains that we work in. Thank you. Um, I would say uh, that what, you know, our approach here and really tying into human rights due diligence is because we are in the field, uh, we are hearing about um, issues, human rights issues that happen in these supply chains. And our approach is really to co-develop with local stakeholders solutions, and then work with companies up and down the supply chain to support those solutions and, and move, um, you know, help move the industries that we work in to a better place for workers, local communities, and obviously the environment. So we've been uh, collaborating with Global Rights Compliance for a, a while now to uh, tra train us and our staff about human rights due diligence, but also uh, uh, work better with companies to get them to adopt this approach, which is clearly being adopted now in regulation. And we realize that companies, um, there's a lot of, of fear out there and a lot of companies haven't done this before. So what we wanted to do today was, uh, maybe the next slide, I'll just introduce our, our panel here, um, where we wanted to have just an open discussion with some practitioners and really um, make, make it more um, uh, accessible for especially companies, but also NGOs that are working in the field to understand what, what does human rights due diligence entail. Um, it is coming up to be a requirement, but it's actually something that can really help companies uh, deal with issues, get out ahead of the problem. So we've put together an all-star panel today. Uh, we'll be starting off with Wayne Jordash from Global Rights Compliance. So he'll start off, um, he's the only one that's, that's using slides uh, because he's going to really explain what human rights due diligence is and where it came from as a concept so that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to move to really more of a, a group discussion. So we have um, some company uh, representatives here today who will introduce themselves. We have Jan Wies from Nestle and Sylvain Couperier from Pladis Global and my colleague Carl uh, calling in from Malaysia who heads the Earthworm office there. So 
after Wayne gets us all acquainted with human rights due diligence, we're going to move to just an open discussion and, and sharing stories and examples and challenges and, and successes from many different supply chains. You'll hear um, Jan and Sylvain and Carl have worked in everything from fresh fruit to seafood to palm oil to cocoa. So um, really, human rights due diligence is a global principle, globally ap applicable. So um, hopefully we'll be, we'll be giving you some examples to inspire you. So I'll hand it over to Wayne. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, much. and sorry. Ask your questions in the chat. Excuse me. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Wayne. No problem. Thank, thank you, Charlotte, and uh, for the introduction. And welcome to everybody who's uh, taking part. Um, as Charlotte mentioned, my name is uh, Wayne Jordash, and I'm the managing partner of Global Rights Compliance. Um, we, we are an international human rights law and development firm, uh, and we specialize in business and human rights. Um, we support governments, uh, corporations, uh, civil society to understand um, what that in fact means. What are the legal demands which uh, are made upon uh, corporations? Um, and individuals and governments and how, in a practical sense, they can comply with those demands. Um, we have particular expertise in supporting businesses operating in conflict affected areas or in areas where there's a real high risk of uh, human rights abuses. Typically, um, as you will appreciate, places where businesses face the greatest risks and operational challenges. Um, our, our approach to this um, is very simple, that prevention is uh, better than cure. And lawyers, um, I'll be the first to admit, and it's a constant frustration of mine, we, we like to mystify the law. Um, we like uh, to create um, the illusion that um, only lawyers can understand it and therefore you uh, need uh, to hire us. Now, that often is the case that you do need to hire us. However, um, there are ways to make law much simpler. And if a lawyer cannot explain the law simply, then he's probably not a very good lawyer. So of course, when we're looking at uh, how corporations need to respect human rights, the first thing we do is reach for the law. What is the framework we're operating in? What does international and national law demand of corporations? Uh, what does it uh, say will put them in jeopardy? What does it say will put them into a courtroom facing uh, the wrath of somebody who's been impacted by their activities? And this is what uh, we're talking about today, really, how to demystify these processes, how to demystify what um, are the processes which a corporation must uh, engage in or should engage in in order to protect itself and to protect um, those who come into contact with its operations and activities. Let me, before moving into some more detail, thank uh, the um, Earthworm Foundation, um, whose uh, work with companies um, in finding sustainable and regenerative approaches to agriculture is, is more important than ever. Um, by helping to define uh, companies' approaches to, to sustainability, and support on transparency and traceability, grievance monitoring, verification and management, uh, they provide an important part of the human rights due diligence puzzle. Now, um, just quickly, I'm going to talk for about five minutes on um, what is essentially due diligence. And I'm going to try to do what the headline suggests and demystify it. Um, so looking at slide two, what are the common risks associated with the agricultural supply chain? Um, as you will appreciate, all sectors and all companies are exposed to human rights risks and, and violations. But those in the agricultural commodities sector face particularly acute human rights risks. These can include the risks of forced labor, child labor, substandard working and living conditions, as well as other risks that uh, impact local communities and their livelihoods, including deforestation, land grabbing, and the exploitation of natural resources such as uh, water. Now, um, 
what does a company need to do to address and confront those risks? Well, we start with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. This introduced or at least crystallized the responsibility of companies to respect human rights and laid out um, the proposition or the demand that in order to fulfill that responsibility, corporations had to, at a minimum, conduct human rights due diligence. What does it mean? Well, you can break it down into four essential steps. Step one, companies are required to identify and assess whether their operations and their supply chain operations risk one, causing, two, contributing, or three, being linked to human rights violations. That's step one. Step two, having identified those risks, to take concrete action in response to those risks, to prevent and reduce the likelihood of the risks turning into harm. Three, oversight of the risks. That is, continuous monitoring and evaluation of steps one and step two. And finally, step four, being open and transparent with stakeholders and the public about the steps you need to take or have taken in relation to those risks and any remediation of any harm uh, caused to individuals by the operations of that company. So um, these four steps um, will protect a corporation, will protect a business, including from reputational damage, from uh, their harm caused or likely the risks um, uh, which um, are confronted by that corporation. And the risk, of course, are first of all, the harm, but also the risks of um, being on the wrong side of an ever increasing number of mandatory legal requirements, uh, which exist in both hard law at the regional, international and national level, but also soft law. As you will appreciate, and you'll see this on slide four, um, there is an increasing number of countries introducing due diligence laws into their legal systems. Last year, Norway and Germany, uh, before that, the French due diligence law, before that, um, the Dutch law on child labour, uh, which was adopted in 2019, which will enter into force in some time in the future. And of course, uh, those due diligence laws are, are um, following on the heels of uh, such things as the UK modern slavery legislation, which was introduced in 2015, which although not mandating due diligence, includes reporting requirements for certain companies on the steps that they need to take or that they've taken to address modern slavery in their supply chains. So there are increasing number of national uh, regulations and national law, and there's an increasing number of international um, uh, regulation and enforcement. Uh, there is no doubt that we are living in an era of an ever increasing and evolving uh, number of legal requirements and legal risks uh, that have to be factored in by any corporation. What do you do to stay on the side of these? Well, of course, you can get bogged down in the detail, um, and many do. Um, you can get frightened of the detail, and many do. But actually, if you take the four steps that I just outlined, um, you will end up staying on the right side of these um, provisions. Um, the provisions speak to a larger trend, of course, which is a larger trend of a demand from uh, the public for better corporate uh, governance. And of course, the national laws that I've just detailed also speak to a more, uh, a larger trend of um, mandatory human rights due diligence. Um, and we'll see this in the EU as we see the tabling of the EU Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence, which if adopted in its current version, will make it mandatory for EU companies or companies that operate in the EU of a certain size to carry out due diligence. Um, and the proposal, it's, 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 it's um, noteworthy, identifies the agricultural sector, the manufacture of food products and the sale of raw materials in their supply chains as high-risk sectors 
which means that companies on this uh, webinar should keep an eye on these developments. So um, returning to this evolving plethora of law, um, you'll all be, of course, aware of the, the Tariff Act, Section 307 of the Tariff Act, uh, the, which essentially legislation, um, you will um, find um, what I've just said about prevention being better than the cure particularly resonant. So let me uh, quickly go back to the four points. I do say very confidently, follow the four points and you will not find yourself in trouble with this um, growing uh, web of legislation or action by customs, patrol, uh, boards, et cetera. Step one, identify and assess. What does that mean? It means stop thinking about mere compliance, ticking the boxes and start being proactive and active. Um, step one means look for the red flags. What is it um, that presents to you as a real risk? Step two, take concrete action in relation to those risks. If you conduct assessments as to the red flags, the concrete actions will soon become relatively clear to you. Um, and you'll need then, of course, to focus on, on them, but you should see these steps as natural, sequential, uh, an evolution of the um, due diligence process. Damage prevention, damage limitation is part of step two. What can you do having identified the red flags to make sure they don't turn into real damage? And having done that, um, having owned that problem, having owned that um, uh, re 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 um, due diligence aspect, moving to step three, oversight. If you've done step one, identify the red flags. If you've done step two, which is taken actions, step three oversight will follow fairly naturally and sequentially. It will seem like a natural step because of course you'll have put some work into step one and step two and you'll want to have oversight. You'll want not to have to go back and do that work again. You can guarantee from step one and step two, once you've got to that place, your work will become simpler you will not have to go back to the beginning again, as long as you have oversight and you continue to own the problem. And step four, you will be proud of the work you've done and you will not be worried about publishing those steps. You will want the public to know and the stakeholders to know of the work you've done in step one to step three. And when conducted properly, steps one to step four, you will know that you have protected yourself from this evolving web of legislation and requirements. You will know that you've identified and assessed the risks independently, and you will have been taking steps towards developing a sustainable system that you will be able to internally operate. You will still need the, the occasional, or rather the periodical, um, third party verification, but if you build step one or step four in the right way, you will be able to operate much of that internally after the original initial uh, input of experts. So to conclude, instead of the old fashioned audits, which we all have seen where human rights barely warrant a mention, what we're talking about is a human rights assessment. It won't cost you more than the audit, it will protect you more though. Instead of speaking to a few local leaders, how about a proper stakeholder engagement process which helps you identify the risks and genuinely engages with the range of local communities to ensure that you stay on top of the risks as well as relevant networks operating in the country and across the sector and across the activity, 
activity and which genuinely engages with their human rights concerns and genuinely gives you the information and flags those risks as um, before they arise and so that you can deal with them. And how about a grievance mechanism that is accessible and effective that also is part of uh, this cycle, if you like, a, a virtuous cycle where stakeholders who are at risk of being harmed can access, can, uh, can provide you with information which enables you to take a more active and, and more, more um, rigorous approach to step one and step four. A virtuous cycle where risks match response and protection flows from ongoing dialogue and solutions tailored to those impacted or potentially impacted in the supply or value chain. These don't have to be intrusive or overly um, uh, resource intensive but they will save you a lot of trouble in the future. Let me stop there and we'll return to some of these issues in the um, discussion later. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, that was a perfect overview for what our, our next speakers will be talking about, which is what they've been doing and actually over their whole careers before we even figured out what the steps were. Um, so I'd like to go directly to, to Jan Wies uh, from Nestle. So, Please uh, uh, give us an overview of your background and experience implementing this approach that that Wayne just that just described um, in the yeah within Nestle or may, or elsewhere where you've worked um, and then maybe yeah give us some of examples of maybe the challenges you've you've had um, and how you've addressed them so over to you Jan thank you thank you very much for the invitation uh, Charlotte um, I guess I'm uh, leaving proof of what Wayne said so I'm not a lawyer. And still I've been working in this area for uh, almost 20 years now, actually. But I do agree with Wayne that, you know, we need more and more lawyers, <laughs> actually, as this, um, as this field of business and human rights is moving from soft law to hard law. Uh, my first advice to um, the uh, organizations and companies that are on this call is speak to your lawyers. Uh, they, uh, they will advise you the right way uh, uh, in, in line with these um, developing legislations. But let me take a step back. Uh, so I've been working in this area for a while. I started at the Swiss Foreign Ministry working on human rights when I still wanted to become a diplomat and then decided I would not to and uh, moved on to the UN. I worked uh, for a year with uh, Professor John Regis team uh, at the very early stage of the uh, mandate uh, on business and human rights and what then became the, uh, the UN guiding principles. But before they uh, were released, I joined uh, the World Bank and IFC, uh, the International Finance Corporation. I wanted to do something very practical. Uh, so I joined uh, the IFC to advise IFC clients on human rights related issues. Uh, it was a great experience because it was the early days of uh, human rights due diligence, even before the UNGPs were released. Uh, and it, it also like brought me to a number of countries and industry sectors uh, from infrastructure to uh, um, extraction uh, to oil and gas uh, and, and other sectors where, you know, these issues are very relevant uh, and then got married uh, and uh, decided to come back here uh, switzerland nestle was looking for a human rights specialist so i applied and get the job i've been doing this for 11 years now with uh, with nestle one thing that i would like to mention uh, i agree with wayne uh, you need to get started somewhere and it doesn't have to be complicated um, uh, i think what wayne suggested as a, as a four-step uh, approach is, is very good and very relevant uh, um, the way that I started things both at IFC and Nestle was through a gap analysis. Uh, just actually, you know, like comparing what we had, again, both at IFC and Nestle, what we had in place in terms of like policies, um, uh, procedures, standards, and which areas of human rights we were covering and what, where, 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 where the gaps were. And it was already, um, I think it's a good step to do still now, I would, I would say, because it basically shows two things. One, that you already cover a lot of ground, that you already have policies out there, including the human resources policy or the uh, your code uh, of conduct for your suppliers that do cover already like a lot of human rights issues. And second, that you still have gaps. And so that uh, these gaps actually uh, need to be addressed uh, in a way or another. 
maybe not from one day to the other, but um, I would say like in a step uh, in a step by step approach. But very rapidly, especially well in both again both IFC and NSD, very rapidly when you know we had done these desktop analyses. Um, that was also, by the way, very helpful to engage a discussion internally, including with top management. So this is where we are. This this, this is what we cover. This is not completely new. Uh, the, some of this language is very familiar with what we do already on, again, uh, human resources, health and safety, the environment sometimes as well. Uh, but very rapidly, we um, had to, we decided to move on the ground actually and see by ourselves, you know, like what that means uh, concretely. So what are we talking about? So it's great to read the UN guiding principles, amazing to follow the four step, simplified four step approach. Uh, access address reports, uh, everybody can understand that. But concretely, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, for a factory, for, um, uh, for a distribution center, for a supplier, for a farmer, what exactly are we talking about? And this is when we started uh, working with the Danish Institute for Human Rights back in 2009 and started, uh, started doing our human rights impact assessments. Uh, we carried out 13 of these human rights impact assessments. Uh, between 2009 and 2017. I can only, uh, I, I don't think I can stress enough uh, the importance of these human rights impact assessments, uh, how much we have learned actually from them by going on the ground, by talking to rights holders, uh, including employees, local communities, suppliers, um, uh, on-site contractors, uh, farmers, co uh, rural communities. Um, uh, and I would say like NGOs and UN agencies and government officials. Uh, this is really like how you can understand what human rights impact means and what is your footprint as a company and the ways actually to address these impacts on the ground. And sometimes I would agree with uh, Wayne, sometimes it's actually easy. It's not, it's not really like rocket science. Other times it can be a bit more complicated, I must say especially when it comes to issues like child labor or forced labor or living income in the upstream supply chain. Uh, even if you follow the four step process um, that Wayne uh, talked about, it still requires actually a lot of work actually to put in place the systems that will help you as a company to address this. But again, it doesn't mean that, and I would advise against you actually jump straight into that. There are a number of steps that you can do um, uh, before uh, uh, before that. Just to illustrate a bit this, this complexity, um, I just want to mention one guy that was, I'm not a big fan of guys because I think there's a lot of guidance out there. So if you come to this webinar and, and you think there is no guidance, I don't know what to do, um, I would advise that you just actually Google business and human rights and you will find a lot of guidance. Uh, we are yeah, we are not short of guidance for sure. Um, I think pretty much every organization has its own guidance. So just select the best one for you. Um, but there is one that was released yesterday and this is um, uh, for uh, conflict affected countries. So what companies should do from a human rights perspective uh, in these um, conflict affected environments. And this is interesting because uh, they are um, uh, basically launching this new concept of heightened human rights due diligence. And I think this is really interesting because uh, I wanted to use this as an example to say, it doesn't mean that you need to do the same things everywhere. Uh, there are some um, facilities in your business operations, or there are some countries that will not require a very like in-depth due diligence. Uh, 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 maybe like an audit will be enough. And I'm, I'm sure that all the companies on this uh, um, a webinar or panel discussion have actually like some audit uh, uh, protocols in place, audit systems that they can leverage. But other environments, uh, like for example, conflict affected environments would require uh, enhanced due diligence, which actually goes much further than what we have been talking about here. Um, Human rights, and I, I, uh, that is going to be my final word, Charlotte, but human rights don't see it only as a risk. It's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity to uh, put people at the center of what you do as a company, either as part of your, um, your like business strategy or your sustainability strategy. Uh, this is really a, a really nice framework, and it is a framework. It's a set of human rights, so it's well defined, 
It's, it's large, it's broad, but it's well-defined. It's, it's a framework that uh, has been very helpful for us at Nestle to really make sure that when we, for example, implement our zero net roadmap or when we implement our packaging strategy or when we actually move towards regenerative food systems, people are at the center of everything we do. And when I say people, that starts with our employees, but also, of course, our suppliers and uh, farmers. This is, uh, this is a really good way to make sure that you know, we transition to a zero net economy, but we do it in a, in a, in a way that is just fair and inclusive. So it's a, it's, it's a great tool to make sure that you deliver not only on the environmental side of things, but also on the social side of things. That's the way we're using uh, it at Nestle as well. Great, thank you, Jan, and, and good inspirational words at the end. Uh, even if it's required by law, it was still a good idea to do it in the first place. So uh, thank you for that. And the report that you mentioned, uh, we can include it in the follow-up email uh, after this webinar. So thank you for that. So let's move now to Sylvain, who uh, has a very interesting background in lots of different sectors as well. So Sylvain, uh, same questions for you. Tell us a little bit about, about your history and journey and maybe take us through some examples of where you've used human rights due diligence uh, to benefit your companies. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Charlotte. And hello, everybody. Um, so I'm currently the global head of sustainability for Pladis. So Pladis is a chocolate and biscuit company. Um, it's um, um, based in the United Kingdom. Here in the United Kingdom, it, uh, it's used to be uh, known uh, as United Biscuits. And we have brands, famous brands in the United Kingdom, such as McVitie's, Jacobs, Cars, Godiva. We have uh, in the Middle East and Turkey, Ulker, Verkad in the Netherlands, or BN in France. So basically, I started working on sustainability slash corporate social responsibility slash human rights 25 years ago when I joined an American company called Dole Food Company, the largest producer and distributor of fresh fruits uh, in the world. And I joined their communication department based in their uh, European headquarters. And the day I joined the company, there was a campaign focusing on allegations of child labor in the Philippines. And I was told, you know, we don't have any clue what's going on in the Philippines. Could you please collect information and respond to the campaign? And at that time, so that was in 1998, Dole Europe's CEO said, you know, this kind of attacks from NGOs focusing either on human rights issues or environmental issues, this is not going to stop. So your responsibility will be to take a proactive approach rather than respond to campaign. So the first step at that time was to work on uh, the implementation of human rights certification. And we worked with Social Accountability International, which is a human uh, New York-based NGO, on um, testing the applicability of their human rights standard, S8000, to agriculture. But then some uh, stakeholders said, oh, these big US multinationals are hiding behind certifications while they do not have their house in order. So we really realized that what was missing actually in some countries, including Costa Rica and Ecuador, was a high quality dialogue with local stakeholders. And I think that I may have the opportunity to provide you with more details regarding how we can develop and work together on um, creating a, a high quality stakeholder dialogue when we talk about collaboration. So I spent 16 years working for Dole. And in 1995, I've joined a company called Tar Union, which is the largest ambient seafood company with brands such as John West in the UK, the Netherlands, Petit Navire in France. And I joined the company in the middle of a Greenpeace campaign, focusing on fish sustainability, but also on illegal practices with the consequence being human trafficking in countries like Thailand. The same year, the EU Commission gave a yellow card to Thailand, uh, again, for illegal practices and practices in relation to human trafficking. So if the yellow card had turned red, that means that Thailand would not have been in a position to continue to export fish or fish products to the EU. So that was a business issue. So the first step was really to make sure that our factories in Thailand were, um, were in order uh, because we're uh, employing a lot of migrant workers, including from Myanmar. So the first step was really to have an NGO train uh, our workers on their rights because most of the workers were not even aware of their rights. The second step was also to implement whistleblowing lines in seven different languages so that the workers who felt um, being deprived of some of their rights had the, the, the possibility to report, um, to report these cases. 
And the third issue was really to make sure that whenever possible, we would hire migrant workers directly instead of relying uh, on agencies, because one of the main issues is that in some cases, migrant workers are requested to pay a fee to these, those agencies, which is considered human trafficking. And that's precisely what we wanted to avoid. It's still a big issue. We talked about palm oil in Malaysia. There was, there was recently a big case with an impact also on the export of uh, some palm oil volumes to the US under the Tariff Act that Swain uh, previously mentioned. But this is a big issue. And secondly, that was to work also with our fish suppliers, making sure that they were compliant with um, human rights standards. So we developed a code of conduct we trained our fish suppliers regarding what they would commit to by signing the code of conduct, because sometimes we just set a code of conduct and assume that the people of the suppliers will understand and sign it. But you need to understand what they will be committing to. And out of 2,000 fish suppliers in Thailand, 58 agreed to sign the code of conduct. And they said, if I don't sell my fish to Thai Union, I will sell my fish to somebody else. So, Again, how can we work on the collaborative approach with the government? Because this time it was really to embark the Thai government to make sure that our standards would become common standards in Thailand. And another uh, topic that we faced is that um, we found cases of child labor in the processing of the shrimps. So we were buying the shrimps without the head, the tail, and the, and the shell. And actually these, these shrimps were processed usually in the by a third party in a back, uh, backyard, in the courtyard in, in Bangkok. And we said, this kind of activity, it's not going to be possible, whoever we work with, to, 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 to properly monitor it. So basically, we hired 1,000 people internally. We internalized this activity and hired 1,000 people to make sure that the pre-processing was done by us with people who were on our payroll, because that was the easiest way to make sure that these people were not um, subject to a human trafficking or that no child labor was, was part of the process. And more recently, three years ago, I joined Pladis, um, and human rights due diligence was more perceived from a compliance due diligence perspective because we are a UK incorporated company and as Wen mentioned we have to, to comply with the UK um, Modern Slavery Act. Uh, so when I joined the company I asked what do we do in the human rights area and I was told oh we have CEDEX. Said, no but what do we do? But, but we have CEDEX. Yes but how do we analyze the information which is on CEDEX? Oh, actually, we don't necessarily have the resources to analyze this information. So don't think that because you have the tool to collect information, you're, uh, you're, um, you're, you're safe. Because if you don't have anybody to analyze this information, it's not worth having the tool. So basically, we used CEDEX and we used the new tool, which is within CEDEX called the Radar Tool, to uh, do a risk assessment of all our suppliers worldwide. Uh, and this has led to make some decisions to suspend suppliers, for example, operating in Xinjiang, which is not always an easy decision to, uh, to make, but because they were not in a position to provide us with enough evidence that they had proper human rights due diligence in place. So this is one of the decisions that we made. So this is in a nutshell, you know, 25 years of experience working with Dole, Thai Union and um, Pladis. Wonderful, thanks, Sylvain. So we'll come back to, to some of those examples. Um, let's turn now to Carl, who's calling uh, in from Malaysia. It's very late there. Thank you for joining us. Um, so yeah, Sylvain just give some examples of some, some real crises that he's had to deal with. And in Malaysia, there have been some very recent examples as well, which, which Sylvain alluded to, of companies in hot water because of human rights violations. And I'm wondering if you think uh, taking a human rights due diligence approach beforehand would have maybe prevented uh, some of these issues from happening uh, so that we don't end up in these crises situations. So, so Carl, please share your experiences with us. You're on mute. Yeah, there you go. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, everyone. I'm Carl uh, from Earthworm, currently based in the Kuala Lumpur office. I am the country head and together with my team, we work with our partners and members in implementing their sustainability policies. So, Taking a human rights due diligence approach is the sensible thing to do um, as a company. In Malaysia, the focus right now is on the topic of force and bonded labor within the broader human rights umbrella. So for some context, um, the International Organization for Migration, or in short, IOM, uh, estimates that Malaysia is the largest migrant receiving country in Southeast Asia. So meaning the risk exposure for FBL is pretty significant. Um, the Malaysian government recently ratified ILO's Protocol 29 in March this year, signifying the country's determination to address forced labor issues. 
So, and, and this follows um, the launch of a national action plan on forced labor late last year. So as you can see, it's starting to get pretty serious. <laughs> um, about time. <laughs> but coming back to the companies and, and the question, um, prevention should be the motivation of companies. Um, this was mentioned by Wayne also as well. Uh, because when crisis happens, be it an expose in a newspaper, uh, NGO campaigning report or sanctions from the US CDP, navigating these uh, time-consuming, challenging as it is complex, uh, costly and largely unfamiliar. So downstream companies like brands need to play their unique role to encourage uh, human rights due diligence amongst their suppliers. So these sanctions that are uh, headline news, uh, they are, there are many speculations on why it has happened, but that is perhaps for a different webinar. Um, but because of this, uh, I believe companies sourcing from Malaysia are turning up the pressure. Uh, initiated producer companies from a variety of sectors are carrying out their own due diligence and building their understanding as they go along. So in time to come, there will be case studies and examples of solutions and mitigation methods that companies in Malaysia could learn from and hopefully follow. At the beginning of a human rights due diligence, uh, a company needs to assess actual and potential human rights risks. So in our experience, companies can be quite surprised to, to what an assessment might find. That realization can be quite bitter to take, but by being proactive through those due diligence assessments and through carrying out mitigation measures, uh, the risk of these issues escalating may begin to diminish. And fingers crossed, no, no sanctions will come your way. Uh, but we do need to acknowledge that force and border labor issues are very deeply rooted and extremely complex, where the root of the challenges already begin to occur before a migrant worker sets foot in Malaysia. So even for us as an organization, working with companies on these issues for many years now, we are still learning and sharing as we continually, continuously peel the layers of this onion. And because of this reality, collaboration is something we strongly believe in. Huh? So the combination of efforts and collaboration amongst government, civil society actors, and private sector provides us the best chance to uphold human rights in, in the country. So also being innovative and creative in the approach is also in, very, very important. Um, I, I feel like that the majority of people that's joined this call is probably on the downstream side. So I'm saying this um, with, that, with that awareness perhaps that producers and suppliers from sourcing countries want to see their buyers putting skin in, into the game. Yeah? As we heard from Nestle and Pladis earlier, it is through committed engagement uh, with the suppliers that um, co-creation, co-owned solutions can be nurtured and put into place. So uh, that commitment, engagement, or that committed engagement builds trust, which is the critical ingredient in the recipe. Great, thanks, Carl. And yeah, I think Sylvain's example of the thousands of suppliers and only 58 signing up to the code is a good, a good demonstration of why you need to bring your suppliers on this journey. You can't do it without them. So collaboration is absolutely essential. Um, great, so I'd like to, um, yeah, maybe just open up the discussion a little bit. I wanted to come back to Wayne um, about your, the fourth step about uh, the importance of transparency in this in process and communicating transparently. Um, that suppliers and their buyers are supposed to be honest about the problems that they're finding in, in the first step, right? And I remember when Nestle published their seafood action plan uh, at the same time that Sylvain was probably going through the drama at Thai Union, um, they were very honest about the gaps that they found in uh, human rights uh, compliance. And um, But we're finding that suppliers are, are fearful of admitting that they have problems, and especially in this new, uh, they're this new regulatory context as well. Um, but yeah, they're feared of getting dropped by their buyers. And I'm just wondering if you had any advice or, or insights into how companies could balance those transparency, uh, legal and commercial considerations when they're, when they're on that transparency step. Yeah, th uh, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that, and maybe I'll be accused of being naive, but I, I'm not sure the, the, the premise of the question, I, 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 I'm not sure I like it, because um, I'm not sure that the two are um, opposed to each other. I think, um, 
you know, transparency, do, does it, uh, is it really such a fearsome uh, beast? Um, I'm not uh, sure it is. I think some studies show that, in fact, customers would be uh, willing to pay more, for example, if they understand that a company is transparent about um, its uh, supply chain and some of the difficulties in it, but also the efforts it's making to actually uh, do something about those difficulties. And I think that that's what um, uh, yeah, I would say about that is, um, of, of course, there'll be some commercial sensitivities. But I think there's also a lot in the process of due diligence, uh, which can be um, effectively disclosed, which um, disclose not just um, the difficulties of, um, that are found in the supply chain, but, but also the steps being taken to um, confront those difficulties. And that's, in a sense, um, a positive story. It's not a, a frightening story. Um, and that, and I, I do go back to the, those studies. I think that the public and consumers and buyers, I think, are, are more ready to accept those difficult stories and, and more uh, ready and, under, and, and want to hear about the steps being taken than perhaps uh, companies um, appreciate. Um, we, we, we have to look at um, transparency in, the, in those terms. Uh, first of all, transparency about the depth and the scope of the problem, and then transparency about um, the milestones of improvement that are being taken by that company. These are powerful stories of uh, rejuvenation and um, innovation. And of course, in, in that process, um, and this is what I find fascinating about due diligence as a whole, in that process, uh, a company, um, a supplier learns about its own operations. It, it spots the risks, it spots the places for improvement. It spots the commercial opportunities, um, which it may have missed if it hadn't been engaging in that process of um, scrutiny, due diligence and, and transparency. So um, to my mind, um, balancing transparency with commercial risk, um, Yes, um, of course, uh, companies can't ignore that, but I think the risks have been somewhat uh, overstated. Um, well, thanks, Wayne. Jan, do you have a, any reaction to that? What is I agree. View? I agree. Yeah, no, this is put on. Uh, that's exactly uh, the message you know, we need to pass. Um, you mentioned the um, uh, 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 seafood reports uh, that we released with the RIT and the action plan. We uh, released a number of uh, these reports uh, in the uh, well, fish and seafood, palm oil, uh, cocoa sectors. Um, all of them have uh, really helped us move uh, the needle internally and externally, uh, not only by uh, also like raising awareness on, on the issue. I mean, we should not underestimate the lack of awareness among the public in general about these issues. Uh, when uh, uh, you know, like uh, people still have the impression that there is no child labor in the cocoa sector or no forced labor in the in the palm oil sector, and it's, this is just widespread, so that helps uh, to also like socialize this. Uh, whether this is our role as companies, I don't know, but uh, we have a role to play here. Um, unfortunately, I think this move towards uh, hard uh, law and uh, legislations in the uh, in the EU, but also in, in the US, as Wayne mentioned, uh, comes with unintended consequences. Um, and um, I think transparency is one of them. Uh, we have uh, actually some of our reports that I've just mentioned have been used against us as part of lawsuits. Basically, uh, you know, with um, American judges saying, well, you know, you see, they know about the issue, so uh, they should act uh, faster or take uh, more actions. So we see a bit more of this, to be honest with you, especially in the US. And I know the US context is very different from Europe, but this is not something that should be underestimated uh, by, by companies. Uh, because there is a risk. But this is why, and I come back to what I was saying at the beginning, take your lawyers with you. I mean, take your legal team with you. I mean, we have a human rights court team at Nestle. Legal is part of it. Uh, they are of great help. I mean, they are absolutely like um, an essential element uh, of our uh, human rights uh, program and uh, of our team. Uh, and they are very supportive. Um, of course, they would advise us on 
against risks that you know we don't we, that, that you know we we, we can avoid uh, 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 but uh, there there is always like a, a solution uh, a solution around around that so this is um I, I leave it there but i think this is uh, this is important to keep in mind that it comes actually with this kind of risk as well Thanks, Jan. Sylvian, do you have any thoughts on the value of transparency, the risks associated with it? Transparency, and as I mentioned, collaboration at the beginning. Uh, let, let me give you a specific example, because for me, um, it's been key when working with Dole to work with local stakeholders on the ground, including critical stakeholders uh, like NGOs, like um, like uh, trade union organizations to understand, identify the issues occurring in my farms or in the farms supplying me. And because that was the only way to fix the issues before they gener degenerate into, into campaigns. Uh, but back to what I said, how do you create a high quality stakeholder dialogue to reach that point? Uh, actually, one of the problems that we had in two specific countries, Costa Rica and Ecuador, was that we didn't have a high quality, we didn't have a di dialogue at all with trade union organizations, and there were some uh, allegations of anti-union practices in the banana industry. So how do you collaborate together to change practices, but also to change mindset? Because it's, it's really about changing attitude, changing mi mindset. So what I did is that I organized a roundtable in Costa Rica, a roundtable in Ecuador with uh, our farm managers, with our main suppliers, with the industry, because that was not only a dull issue, that was an industry problem, with the ministers of labor, with local NGOs and trade unions. And basically I said, freedom of association is not a dull standard. It's not a nice to have. It's part, it's entrained in the core conventions of the international labor organization. And the minister of labor from both countries said, oh, this is also what is in the law Local law, and this is what we understand as freedom of association, because sometimes some people in the farms were having anti-union practices without being aware, being conscious that this was a breach of the laws on freedom of association. And then I brought some major customers from Norway, where the quality of social dialogue is very high. And I said, and these people said, you know, this is not only a dual requirement. We as a customer, we want you to have also a high quality stakeholder dialogue, because for us, that's a way of living. Um, so, and money talks, but it was not just about putting the pressure. So back again, how do we change mindsets? And actually what we did in the follow-up sessions is that we brought some suppliers, we brought some farm managers, we brought the trade union organizations to a, a stakeholder dialogue in Norway so that they can see on the ground how employers, how trade union organizations in Norway, how they have built this high quality social dialogue. And, you know, just because they were all in this informal setting, having breakfast together, lunch together, dinner together, this has contributed to ch change the mindset. And this has contributed to create trust. So I think that this was a, a good example of how you can try to change mindsets in order to increase and build on collaboration. Great, that's, a, that's an inspiring example. I don't know, Carl, if you have any, any examples to share of yeah, this idea of building collaboration in the supply chain, anything, any challenges to doing that in Malaysia? Yeah, I think, I think the example that Siwan raised was a really, really an interesting one. I think um, one thing that we're working on in, in the SCFS landscape here in Malaysia is trying to, <clears throat> try to pull together a combination or, or review what is the best uh, grievance mechanism uh, a plantation company could use within their third party supply chains, right? So we believe although there are already existing um, different tools out there, even the tool created by the government itself, there, there is no obvious silver bullet yet, right? So there's definitely space for exploration. Um, and it would probably even uh, likely allude towards a combination of different tools. And it really depends on the setting. So I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, collaboration vertically, you know, across the supply chain, upstream, downstream, horizontally across all the different stakeholders is absolutely necessary. If, if we were to have any chance of finding that perfect combination uh, specific to grievance mechanism, I, we're going to try out different tools. We want to try to see if, you know, the tools could complement, different tools could complement each other. And of course, see if it works on the ground. So um, that's something that we're pretty active in in the coming months uh, and will be in the coming months. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely believe collaboration is gonna is, is the right way to go for it. Thanks, can, can Carl. I, yes, Wayne. Can I just jump back in very quickly, just from a, a legal perspective, a legal risk perspective? 
I think, um, I mean, it's, it, it's very interesting listening to the other speakers who obviously, um, uh, especially um, Jan and, and Sylvan, who are in the corporate world. Um, but I, I can say from the human rights world, um, human rights activists who are looking to bring these cases tend to not aim at those companies who are show, uh, reflecting a good faith effort to be transparent. You know, that, that's not who um, human rights activists and litigants are generally interested in. Of course, there's exceptions to that, but if I was uh, representing a, 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 a civil society organization and I saw an organization which was genuinely attempting to have stakeholder engagement, genuinely interested in confronting and being transparent about the risks and the, the harm that was caused, you know that when you get to a courtroom, that's going to be that has have less traction. So you would tend to look at those companies who are on the other side, who are trying to ignore a problem, who know about it, but are ignoring it and are trying to hide it. So I think there's some really hard lessons there about some hard realities there about who is at risk and, and why they're at risk and, and, and what to do about it. And transparency is a way of Mini minimizing often, not always, as uh, Jan um, says, but often. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that from a from a legal uh, context. Certainly, companies that are doing their due diligence are are protected from being accused of not doing so. Right on the NGO campaign side, I'm not sure if that's always the case because when I when I was working in fair trade bananas, I remember really people liked attacking Dole because we they knew that they would move, <laughs> whereas their competitors weren't doing anything. So, um, but maybe now Sylvain would thank them for doing that, for pulling Dole into a better place. So, <laughs> and then inspiring the rest of the industry to do better as well. Sometimes proving the case is, is important. And so, um, I think I think I'm gonna, sorry, go ahead Sylvain. And same thing for Thai Union. When I was speaking about the Greenpeace campaign, the fact the fact that they focused on Thai Union, Thai Union was the leading industry, leading actor in the fishing industry with very strong brands, and committed to make a change. So they focused on that company, and they did really focus on that company to blame that company. But really, the message behind the Greenpeace campaign was take the responsibility to push the industry forward in the area of sustainability and human rights. This is your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. I think I think we're gonna we're gonna end it there. Um, we'll send out a follow up uh, with some some guidance materials. There are our favorite ones, <laughs> to Jan's point, uh, and the recording. So thank you all very much for joining. Thank you to my all star panel. It was really a great discussion, as as we're hearing in the chat. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.